on scalability. I'm your moderator, Theo Goodman. And uh, we're going to go do a quick intro of every person. Um, don't shill too much. We can shill bigger at the end, but just give us a break. You know, tell us what company you're from or what project you're working on in relation to our panel. Paul first. Okay, hello. Is this on? Um, my name is Paul. Uh, my current affiliation is Director of Research at TRN. Um, before that, I have a background in economics and statistics. And while I was working at, in academia at the Yale Econ Department, I invented something called TruthCoin, and then I started a blog called truthcoin.info. And uh, long story short, I invented a sort of side chains technology called DriveChain, and that is kind of allows you to just use something like Bitcoin Cash, uh, but on top of Bitcoin Core, and that is the context in which people usually want to learn about what effect it might have on scalability. So that's that in a really short. Yeah, my name is Alan Pichatello. I'm the director of product at Blockstream. Uh, I handle all of our products, uh, mostly focused on Liquid. If you want to learn more about what I do and what we do, I'll be uh, in Ballroom D, I think, after this, uh, going in more detail there. My name is Jason Dreisner. I'm currently working on BitOff. It's at bitoff.com, B-I-T-A-U-T-H.com. Um, before this, uh, I was at BitPay for six years. Okay, great. So when we talk about scalability, a lot of people like to talk about the block size limit. Um, Paul, why is there a block size limit at all? And was that um, originally part of Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, that's kind of cool. That, that, that's the only way we can even think about what it should be is to know what it's, what it's there for. So it's a really perfect question. There was originally no explicit block size limit, although there were various implicit limits. Um, but Satoshi himself, in July 2010, he added this one megabyte Im, uh, limit to prevent a kind of denial of service attack. Uh, and in so doing, he in the later months, he remarked that he would have this effect of making the nodes easier to run, which is, its, I think, the primary justification for it today, which is that it, it keeps the, makes it easier to run a, a full node of Bitcoin, and it makes it easier to do so anonymously or without too much of a, you know, it, it impairing the other things you might want your computer to do or your internet connection to do. Okay, great. So, um, uh, Alan, uh, do you think there are any trade-offs for having a uh, one megabyte block size, and uh, what are they? Yeah, so the trade-offs, uh, you know, that's one of the things a lot of people in this space want to have everything for free and no constraints. Um, but there's always going to be engineering trade-offs. So with the block size limit, you have kind of a couple of factors here. One, you have the initial uh, block download time. So if you're starting up a new node from scratch, you never saw Bitcoin, now you're into it, you're going to need to sync up. And that takes a, you know, that's dependent on how big the blocks are of how much data you're going to sync and dependent on how much time it's been since the beginning of Bitcoin. So that's one big uh, important factor. Uh, the other factor is being able to keep up with the network as it goes along. Uh, so that's, you know, a little bit easier of a factor is if, if you could catch up to begin with, you're probably able to keep going, uh, depending on if it's growing or not. And then the last factor is with mining. So the, the miners themselves have to transmit a lot of data between each other. And if, if they are mining a block while they're still receiving the previous, blo uh, previous block, they basically are, are at a disadvantage. So there's a big uh, incentive for centralization of mining, the bigger blocks get. So that's also another concern. Now, we've done a lot of optimizations to to mitigate that and to try to you know, pre-synchronize as much of that data as possible, but it still is a, an important consideration uh, if you expand too greatly. Um, uh, Jason, um, okay, we're, they both mentioned you know, how long it takes to download uh, the blockchain, you know, for a node to download a blockchain, but um, why do I even need to do that? Why can't I just use a wallet where I don't have to download all this stuff? What is my incentive to even download all this stuff. I mean, miners have to do it. Every miner is a node, but why do I need to even download this stuff? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, for most users, it's actually not really important um, because uh, as a user, um, unless you're part of the mining ecosystem or perhaps the ecosystem that is uh, validating whether the chain is being honest right now, um, then it's not particularly important to you as a user. 
But the people to whom it's important are the miners, because um, they want to make sure that they're on the chain that all of the miners are on. Um, and then another demographic of, of users, a, a sub-demographic, that is trying to validate that um, what the miners are doing is honest. And they're telegraphing that thing to the rest of the users. Um, so if you're one of the technical, technical people that is, that is going to be describing that and conveying that to the rest of the masses, then, um, then uh, it does make sense for you to run a full node. OK, yeah. so, so is, there, is there any in, or um, Paul, you can also add to this. Is there, there is, that is a disputed point. So okay. I mean, I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I want to just be the guy who disputes it, but uh, it is. That's a, <laughs> if you don't, I will. Yeah. I, so the, there's a kind of uh, should everyone run a full node? The way I I reframe the whole thing in terms of the the cost, the literal dollar amount of it requires to create a new full node, and so I say it should be easy as it should be as easy as is reasonable to run a full node. There are all these trade offs. Um, you cannot. It, it would be free to run a full node if it did nothing. Um, it's more expensive if it does more things. So, but you, in general, the cheaper the nodes are, the easier the network is to. Um, it's easier is for you to understand whether or not you've actually gotten money or not. So when you use uh, the normal banking system, you have to like log into BankofAmerica.com or something, and you look at the screen, and it shows you whether or not you have money. And the full node is the thing that you look at in Bitcoin to see whether or not you have any money. Now there are these clever tricks where you can. There's this SPV mode idea, which is, is pretty clever, which says you can very, very easily check with using just like 4.4 megabytes per year fixed amount. You can very easily check to see whether or not miners have done a lot of work on the chain. And so in that way, you can get some conjectural knowledge about whether or not you're looking at the, the right chain just by kind of just cheating and only checking the easiest to check part. Um, but of course, again, if no one is running these full nodes, then we have no way of knowing what miners are actually putting in the blocks. They could put double spins. They could just put printed money in there. So it's a complicated thing, I'm sure. So the, is, there there any incent, is there any incentive beyond an ideological incentive to support the network to just r oh, to yes. not be a miner node? Yes, because you want, it's the only way of knowing you've been paid, for sure. Of course, there's no real way of knowing, like completely for sure. But in the same way that you would never know with Bank of America for sure, or that you know that this isn't all a dream or something like that. But you know, this is the rules that if you the full node will download all the blocks and check all the transactions in the blocks, and then you'll you'll know that you're looking at the same thing as everyone else, and you'll know that it obeyed all those these rules about double spending and 21 million coin limit, etc. Yeah, I'm going to take serious issue with what he said there. What he's saying is drastically different than the threat model that was, it has always existed throughout Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin was designed to have a system where any user of the system could verify the correctness of it. And what he's saying is, now I don't just need that software to validate it. I shouldn't use the software. I should just rely on Twitter or Telegram and go look for my nerds to tell me when it's messed up and hope the miners don't, don't change the incentives of the system. So the analogy I always use is if, if you ever go to a casino, uh, all the money gets dumped into this one room and there's a whole bunch of people in there counting the money. And there's cameras everywhere. There's two people for everything. There's, there's all kinds of people watching the system. And you can make the argument that, well, you know, we've had this casino open for 20 years. No one's ever stole the money from it. Let's just turn off the cameras. No one's going to steal. And what he's suggesting is we just let the people in the room decide whether they're stealing the money or not. And no one should watch. And maybe some guy will happen to watch, look by and watch and... If they happen to steal the money, then then he'll go sound an alarm and go tell everyone. It's it's drastically changing it. Uh, and the most important part of Bitcoin, in my opinion, is that there is no central authority. There's no central person telling you whether it's correct or not. We're all equals. Everyone has equal power to be able to see and validate and do that. And then it's like as Paul said, this is the only way to know you've been paid. And if you're just going to rely on someone else to tell you you've been paid, why are you using Bitcoin? Just use Bank of America. I trust Bank of America more than random anonymous miners all over the world who have no identity, I have no proof of who they are, I have no recourse. At least with Bank of America, I can sue them. I should note, yeah, um, I think Paul's description was, was extremely accurate. Um, it's the benefit I, of being in the middle of the two. And yeah. <laughs> right. switch, um, switch spots. But, <laughs> but um, I, in the casino example, I, I, I maybe... Uh, Better description is saying that uh, running your own full node is like having everybody in the casino also checking that room. 
Um, but it, that's, it's not exactly a good example either because the casino is the only entity that really cares about what's happening in that room. Um, so uh, there's, it's most definitely not like turning off the cameras or not checking because all of the people who have an economic incentive to do the checking, um, exchanges, businesses, miners, and people who are otherwise interested like you and me, um, they all have an incentive to keep checking. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that um, it's, it's not exactly that black and white. Um, there's actually kind of an equilibrium between, uh, and this is obvious because this is how the world works right now. You can just objectively look at the network and see this is what's happening. Um, there are some people running SPV nodes because they believe um, that by and large, um, they just want to know that they are, they are receiving what is currently most prominent with the chain that they've chosen. And there are different forks now. There's BTC and BCH and BSV and stuff. Uh, so they, they might choose something that was like a contentious fork. They might want to just follow the fork they've chosen. But past that, they don't need to, to, to parse through every transaction necessarily because it's not really within their threat model. Um, but other, other users, uh, me for example, um, I like running a full node because I, I, I don't necessarily want to trust uh, someone like me um, to kind of sound the alarm when things like that happen. Um, but the way that the ecosystem actually works in reality is that there is a there is an equilibrium there where it's, it's always tugging between people who are um, either tugging between kind of convenience and the, the ability to check this stuff and, um, and doing it yourself entirely, uh, a lot like a division of labor thing. Um, so it's, it's perfectly reasonable that, the, that there are, uh, there's an ecosystem of people who are telling you um, what is uh, currently the state of the BT, BTC chain or the BCH chain or the BSV chain, uh, and you don't necessarily need to run a node for all of them. If, uh, if you don't want to check them all, right? Um, but there, there's uh, the, nothing, to, nothing uh, about the system breaks if everybody in the world is, um, is, is not also validating at the same time. I, I think, oh, yeah, I don't know about that. I think it's fine until the last sentence. Well, I think it's, right. you don't need everyone to do it. Everyone's going to choose their own threat model in there. And, but the ability is, it's a, you know, and it's not, as you said, it's not a black and white thing. It's, it's a grayscale. So... You know, you have a certain point where it's just so simple to run. Anyone can run a node. So Bitcoin back in the early days, there was nothing happening. Pretty much you could boot it up on any computer and it didn't cost you anything. And you go to the other extreme where it's Ethereum where no one can keep up except for like enterprise class servers and you just use an API. So, and then you have anywhere in the middle of there. And, you know, there's going to be different points where some people are going to say, this is too much, I can't run a node anymore. And it's going to depend on your economic incentives. And so the economic incentive of running, I think, Theo, you're getting at this. So I'll, I'll preemptive, uh, preemptively jump into that question, I guess. What, what's the incentive to run a node is how, I want to know if I got paid. So if I'm not getting paid, if, if I'm not accepting payments, it really doesn't matter if I run a node. Uh, Especially it doesn't matter if you're giving away your money. You, don't, you couldn't care less, right, if it goes through or not. <laughs> you're hoping it fails to go through, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's only right. when you're receiving well, the money that I you that want to just, actually get it. I think just to you know rephrase basically like why 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 even have I think what most people what you're basically saying is the reason for the block size limit is so that you can run a full node. I guess I just want to one mention re something one funny, reason which is I just to, want to say to reduce that the I, cost of it. Yes, right to make to make that the ecosystem of people who are validating significantly larger. So just so why not just get rid of the block size limit and just go limitless. Yeah, because then you would have, it, the costs of running the full node might be potentially unbounded and that would lead to like unlimited increase in how burdensome it is to run the full node. So then, right, and you get a little bit of a tragedy of the commons there because uh, right. certain miners might have weird incentives okay, uh, just in order to, to do that. But, but, but they would have but incentives. But does storage as an get cheaper and cheaper over time and internet speeds get faster and faster yeah. and so well, on? One would hope that it would co-vary. The cost of running a node would kind of be something that could react to prices in hard drive space and bandwidth things. But obviously it's, there's no like, it's, it's a lot easier to just pick a number and just put it in there than it is to like build some bizarre measurement system for that. Okay. All right, so um, fail to work I would agree entirely. Yeah. All right, so why do we even need to scale? What is the, what's the point of it, and uh, why do we even need to do it at all? Jason? I mean, I'll go. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll start if, on we, that if side. we want crypto uh, in general to um, be uh, the new standard for money globally, then um, it's very important that people can make transactions. 
Um, right. So, but however, that is, you know, between uh, money between the it's between very, chain yeah, and or on chain, it's very is that stopping anyone effects. from making a transaction? If there's, let's just say, there was no second layer, and there's just a uh, five hundred. Uh, meg uh, one yeah. megabyte or half a megabyte or whatever. Is that going right. to stop anyone from really transacting? Um, well, I mean, specifically, uh, it doesn't uh, when it's being used as a um, as a cap, as it's, if it's being used as a uh, basically a spam protection mechanism uh, to, to reduce the chance that the, the cost of it running a full node will grow exponentially very quickly and at the, uh, by surprise. So the most important thing there is we don't, then as a network, we don't want to, to be surprised by how quickly the cost of, of running a node grows. We want to be able to make a definitive decision about that point. Um, and so, and that's how we, we tame that tragedy of the commons by having a block size limit. Okay, I have um, a, it I is have, arbitrary where we put that and it's a value judgment. Okay, I have a, qu I have a question. Um, Alan, if I send uh, you a rare Pepe, is that a spam transaction? I'm of the opinion of, of if it's valid transaction, it's competing against all other valid transactions, and it follows all the rules. It's not spam. Um, I know yeah, there's I'm some different that opinions. That's also contentious, but I agree that it's like how. Yeah. What else would you? Yeah, 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 yeah. you could say non describing something as spam is always going to be completely arbitrary. It's um, what I'm saying there is specifically if you get a weird incentive for some so for some miner to do one of these kind of uh, end game attacks that that um, you're worried about with block sizes. Well, if it's cheap, then people will consume more of it, and then everything that. The miners will get a transaction fee every time, but the, f they, the full nodes have to also pay. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, the full nodes are sharing in the work, but they don't get any of the credit, and they have to keep doing this forever, whereas the miners can kind of just forget about it. So this is not, the incentive is not quite, there's a tragedy of the commons, and it's not quite. Yeah. Well, and even the miners way. can sometimes have an incentive where adding more data has a negative cost because it harms competition more than it harms them, therefore they get a bigger share of the pie. So that gets even, even more perverse incentives. Yes, but I, that was a concern a while ago, but I think now that everyone SPV mines and SPY mines, it's like almost, it's sort of that particular concern doesn't really apply anymore, but that is a thing that can happen. Kind I guess, of theoretical I in 2013 and 2014. Okay, then. Um, well, I actually had, a, I was going to say, going does everyone agree? I was first going to say that I run Electrum in SPV mode, so I do not run my own full <laughs> node, which I think, is, I think it's fair to ask everyone if they run their own full node or whatever. And I just think, like, I do think that it, it's in practice, it's good enough. If I were going to receive a huge amount of money, I would switch to running the full node. But I, you know, I don't. Uh, yeah. The money I received, uh, and specifically, you probably wait for more so. confirmations than six. That's true. You would wait for more confirmations, and <laughs> especially you would, in this you just fork, fork like, heavy world. Well, eventually, in the wide world of Bitcoin, with all the exchanges and all the block explorers, someone would notice the fork. You just hang out on IRC, and but that's a little bit like about what exactly. you know, Alan was saying. It was like wouldn't be good enough, or would be good enough, and it depends on type of transaction you're making. But first, I wanted to just admit that I don't actually run <laughs> full node, which I think is fair for you all to know. And I also wanted to say, I wonder if we can all, all the three of us can agree that Ethereum kind of messed it up, and now it's just <laughs> too, it's too difficult to run a node in Ethereum, and that is just objectively bad, and they just now like cross the threshold of just being unreasonable, where you have to go to this one company, and you don't even know like what they're doing there, and you pay them whatever it is, $5,000 a so year you, or something. You heard it here first, Paul does not run a full node. Get on crypto Twitter right now. <laughs> What a bad person. <laughs> he's, he's truly awful. What an awful, yeah, what an awful person. <laughs> right? I have awful, something else yeah. to say as Heresy. well, though, on, uh, related to that, which is that there is a kind of, um, there is a kind of virtue signaling also, which is like, oh, everyone should run a full node, and we're definitely looking out for you, you know, we, look how great we are. Um, we insist on absolute security to protect your money, blah, 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 but in the, at the end of the day, it doesn't really make that much of a difference, and it's your, it's your headache to run the full node, you know, it, it's uh, it's uh, what, uh, what, how much is it? Uh, how, how many hundreds of gigabytes are? I mean, if are I don't get to virtual now? signal, and then what do I get? It's yeah, it's, it's worth you like Twitter. Nothing. So. It's worth going further and clarifying that if you're running a full node and you're doing it secretly, you're not helping the network. You're doing it for yourself. The the thing that helps the network is if you're running a full node and if something bad happens, you alert the network. Um, yeah, but you should never like, want to help other people. You should only do it for yourself. <laughs> Just only run the. But you should do really think I mean, selfishly. Yeah, so if you were going Otherwise to virtue signal, hard to figure out what happens. If you're going to virtue signal, signal properly, you need to set up a website that tells people what the current block is or something yeah, like that. So you can actually be useful rather than just kind of running your software in secret. Well, I think I mean that's what he's. You know, there's this this ill-conceived notion that running a node helps the network. Um, there's some point to that, I guess, because you're helping oh. people that aren't running full nodes, which 
that's debatable in itself whether you should do that. Um, you know, make basically let them yeah. leash the costs off of you. <laughs> There's another thing that you cannot start up a new full node unless someone out there also has a full node. So it's like, right. you need so, you need yeah. at least one other full node to be out there. But the uh, it's like yeah. torrent seeding. Yeah. Um, but Paul Paul asked uh, was asked you know does he run a full node and and I I think I may have a similar answer to him and I think he might have said he kind of runs a full node when like he gets a big payment. So I'm in the same boat. Um, you know, if I get a payment from someone I trust, if well, you know, someone that's not as awful as Paul, I guess. <laughs> he brought it on himself. <laughs> I have to do it. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, like at Blockstream, part of our pay is in Bitcoin, and and I'm willing to look at my phone's wallet, which is using some central server, to tell me I got paid because I trust that I'm going to get paid. But I, when I'm getting payments from you know awful people like Paul, I guess I I would run a full node to make sure I'm actually getting paid before I. I deal with it, uh, so I you know I run a node when I need to run a node. Uh, I'm not I'm not uh, like I have to run it full time all the time. Uh, I run it when I'm accepting a, a payment from someone I don't trust. I run it periodically just to reconcile that yes, I actually have been paid for the last three months. That's probably useful, um, but it's not something I, I obsess over running full time. I run the full node also just to um, have API access to get information that I need. That's also yep. useful. But at the same time, I think we all agree that if it costs too much to run a full node, then we're doomed because then you would never be able to like figure out whether or not you had been paid or not and the network would basically just stop doing anything and it would, then it would be doomed. I didn't answer Paul's question that is Ethereum broken and, and the answer is yes. If you didn't figure that out from my earlier comment. All right. Um, so, no. well, on, on your question, I guess it's uh, maybe awkward that maybe I'm the only person on the stage who runs a full node. Um, <laughs> uh, discussing our previous positions, yeah. <laughs> but um, right, and I think it's maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit proof that the purpose of a full node is not this kind of uh, um, arbitrary, altruistic thing where you're helping the network in some, you know, strange way. Um, it's helpful to seed uh, seed data. It's very helpful for us to be able to validate properly. But I'm seeding, so you probably don't need to, um, unless you don't trust me, right? <laughs> unless you don't trust me to delete stuff. That's it's different with Bitcoin because. All you have to do is trust that somebody in the world won't delete it because we can know whether or not it's correct if it's not deleted. So you just need somebody to be running it. And it's, uh, in a lot of ways, it's a lot like um, sidechains. Um, you just need someone to be validating it. And, uh, and there's, it's a very, very obvious crime if they fail. All right, let's, uh, now that we've <laughs> talked about why we need to scale or why we should talk about you know, solutions that are coming out, and uh, we'll just start with Lightning. Alan, what's Lightning? Lightning is a second layer solution that allows people to not only just route payments between two individuals, but between any connected individuals through paths. So this lets you pay virtually anyone nearly instantly with delayed settlement. So it's, it's a way of uh, removing a lot of the transactions uh, from the blockchain and leaving the blockchain more as a kind of final settlement layer. So if I um, use Lightning, do I, can I fake lightning out and, you know, just use fake Bitcoin? Yeah, that was weird. Um, who said, uh, who said, someone said yesterday there's this abacus idea. This is like perfect metaphor where it's like, uh, yeah. And it's like, uh, so Alan and I, or Jason and I, we need to like make a, or actually it's cool because we're kind of in a line. You could kind of, but, um, it's like you have one transaction to like create this abacus with those like these little beads. And some of the beads are like over, he's got a bunch more and I've got only a little. And then he, yeah, this, the beads are, yeah, the middle, middle out compression. And uh, the, the, once we've done that on the network, then off, off chain, we can like move the little beads back and forth. And I can say that he owes me beads for things and he can give them to me. And then it only clicks back onto the network if there's a, a dispute. And the clever thing is you can then just have, go through different people and have all the little beads be locked onto some random R value, and if someone shouts the R value, then they all kind of go through in like a big click thing. And uh, so then you can pay people that you don't even know. And so it's, it's pretty neat. It's a pretty cool idea. All right, what are some of the uh, trade-offs for Lightning? And, um, you know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of nerdy right now to use. Um, it's why, and why aren't people using large amounts in it? You know, there's a limit to how much uh, you can use it right now. Why, why is there a limit, and why are people using it for small amounts, um, not big amounts, and uh, can I just close a channel and you know, somehow defraud you? What are the risks? Yeah, so the uh, limits in are in place. So I remember Rusty 
mentioned this to me when he said it. Uh, he, he didn't want anyone, it's new software, he didn't want anyone to lose more than a beer. Uh, the price of Bitcoin has changed a little bit in the last two years, um, so it's now quite expensive, maybe a nice, you know, drink of scotch instead of a, a super fancy scotch instead of a beer, but, you know, it, it's still early. Um, there's still a possibility for loss, and there's a slightly different model of backup. So, so you, you mentioned, you know, what could go wrong? Could you, you know, lose your money? And this relies on reactive security. So if, if a, a bad transaction or a previous state was broadcast, unless I'm reacting to that, uh, it's possible that someone could defraud me out of the money. Uh, and there's some advancements coming. Um, we'll talk about this probably more in the Lightning panel, but uh, that will allow a much easier way to uh, recover funds and react uh, more efficiently uh, with a proposal called L2 um, that will allow you know, third parties to watch for you in a much easier way and you don't have to worry about if I accidentally broadcast the wrong sta state that someone's gonna steal my funds. Uh, so there's still you know, room for advancement in Lightning but it's uh, coming along nicely. Jason, you have anything to say about that? <clears throat> yeah, um, so in general, I think Lightning is a very cool system. Um, I just gave a talk uh, an hour ago about a, um, an, a, a language and a compiler and an IDE that I've been working on um, as an open source project. Uh, it'll probably be released fairly soon after this video gets out. Um, but uh, it's a, a way to uh, work with Bitcoin script and an editor and, and see the, a line by line evaluation of what's going on with the stack. Um, so there's some very cool stuff in Lightning and some very clever constructions with Bitcoin script. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I think Lightning is also uh, very exciting as a as a, uh, a way of compressing certain types of transactions um, where your threat model is maybe different than, than the things you want to use on chain for um, and making, making those transactions significantly lighter weight for, you know, they're, they're uh, saving, saving significant uh, cost to the network in order to do that. Um, I, I would say it does not necessarily follow that just because I think lightning is cool that um, the entire world should be you know, using Lightning for everything, um, I would be concerned about some censorship resistance properties that, that, uh, that are maybe slightly inferior on Lightning that are doing pretty well on chain. Okay, so if I open a channel with you, who owns um, the Bitcoin in the channel? Um, it, so it's, it's quite cool with uh, the Bitcoin scripting language um, is actually a language uh, designed to uh, create authentication requirements. Um, so it's, it's one of the things I think is most cool about Bitcoin as a system. Um, it's a very, it has a very, very clever way of doing authentication. Rather than some massive spec, if you look at all sorts of different authentication plans, they've got 80-page you know, specs for uh, you know, OAuth 2.0 and a few others. Uh, look at some of the newer authentication stuff, it's even more. Um, they have these massive static specs for how authentication is supposed to work. And you fit your use cases into those specs. And Bitcoin is pretty cool because the spec is just a, a virtual machine for a, for a you know, hypothetical stack-based language, um, which makes it really easy to use some basic primitives um, to describe how you want to authenticate to get your Bitcoin. So you can have a single signature, or you can have a, a multi-signature thing, or you can have a multi-signature with an if statement with a fallback that falls back to something else, and after 72 hours, you can sweep it if they don't get out of the channel. So it's, it gets really, um, you can do some really creative stuff, and you can, you can design your own schemes that are very complicated. Um, and light, Lightning is, a, is one scheme, it's, it's actually not very complicated, um, it's, uh, but it's, it uses that, that programming language quite cleverly. Um, to avoid uh, some serious counterparty risk in, uh, in ways that are, that are impossible to do on something that's not like Bitcoin. Um, so in a, very, um, in a very general sense, uh, for example, if the world's banking systems were running on Lightning in 2008, um, we would have been in a much better position as a society. Um, so there's some really cool things that you can get out of this, this scripting why, language. Why would, we, why would we be in a better position if the banking system used Lightning in 2008? Um, I think that... Uh, that uh, the mainstream people like to call it contagion now, but uh, you know, uh, having having reserves here that are expected to be going to another bank that are expected to be going to another bank, um, the, the lightning on some levels enforces um, some some scarcity of the assets on the chain. Um, there is a discussion of whether or not uh, you're validating what the state of the of the lightning network looks like, and so we're back to that discussion again of whether or not you want to be running a full node, whether or not you want to be running a lightning watchtower or whatever. Um, so and I'm not even too familiar with what it looks like these days, um, but uh, yeah, so it, it's it's interesting there. But um, I I uh, I would I would 
hesitate to say that um, that Lightning is the is the be all end all solution to get everything everything off chain so that we just use Bitcoin for settlement. I think that would have some very scary, um, that potentially scary results for censorship resistance, which is the reason I'm into Bitcoin. Um, why not just use an altcoin instead of Lightning? If you want to do, you know, just use another chain that's cheaper. Uh, Paul, what do you think? Well, the, uh, the existence of altcoins, I think, as uh, Gavin Andreessen put it, is a kind of, it is a kind of way of like cheating around the 21 million uh, Bitcoin limit um, because there's this fixed amount of stuff in the world and then there's a fixed amount of purchasing power, like money, your ability to buy that stuff, and then it's all just divided among all the world's monies, like US dollar, yen, whatever, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, etc., Ethereum. And so they all kind of compete with each other for claims on all the stuff in the world. And when you have these altcoins, you're just, it's basically an inflation tax on Bitcoiners. And there's, there's no, mm, well, uh, well I'd say that I'll say there's no reason to use an altcoin when you could just simulate that with a sidechain in, in my own project. But that's, you know, that's also like cutting edge. So it'll be very contentious. Is there ICO? Yeah. yeah. Nope, there's no ICO. Damn. None of that. Throw them off the stage of things. Yeah. So why, yeah, why should I use, offering. why shouldn't I, uh, Alan, why shouldn't I just use an altcoin instead of um, Lightning? I get the features of being, sens if it's a proof of work chain, I you know, have the censorship resistant feature and um, it's probably, might be cheaper fees, might be faster. Yeah, so, I mean, an altcoin by its nature is going to be less secure than Bitcoin. It's, it's, as Paul mentioned, it's the inflation tax. Bitcoin's a lot more than just a payment network. It's not just a way to pay people. It is also sound money. It is the soundest money ever created. And every time you take an attack on that by saying there's another coin and it's just as good, you're basically diluting the supply and you're limiting the potential of, of Bitcoin. And, you know, we have in the world currencies everywhere. We have yen, we have dollars, we have uh, ruples, we have, you know, everything out there. But... Uh, in the end, it would be better if everyone had their own money. I've been to three countries in the last two weeks, and I have change in my pocket from all these countries, and it's kind of useless to me. And that's a friction. And if there was one currency that could do that, um, Bitcoin ideally should be the one that does that. And, and you know, when you're transacting with these altcoins, you're changing to a different security model. They could be 51% tacked uh, very easily. There was an attack on, what was it, Ethereum Classic pretty recently. Um, and, and every time you have these, these minor chains, you're basically splitting the proof of work, making everything else less secure, less stable, and harming uh, cryptocurrencies in general. So it's, everything should be on Bitcoin if we can do it. And doesn't, the doesn't exchange rates are annoying. Doesn't Blockstream have I'm, I'm, Litecoin and uh, stuff <laughs> and uh, Grin and stuff like yeah. that? Are they harming Bitcoin? I, we don't have any of those things, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, the worst we do is um, we give you data about it. Um, but now Blockstream is, um, I think we might have some Bitcoin cash in, on, our, on our physical Bitcoin that we haven't peeled the stickers off, but that's um, maybe the bit. But yeah, no, yeah. We, we've dumped everything that's dumpable. It, it, we are a Bitcoin-centric company. So it's just nice. a data service um, for Litecoin and someone working on Grin that Works for blockchain. No one, no one, no one, no one at Blockstream works on Grid. So okay. that's also not. You heard true. it here first. Crypto Twitter. Uh, I would, uh, I would agree with <laughs> um, high level. I would agree with um, uh, most of the points that both of them made. Um, and I, I'll add only a few other things. Um, first, uh, uh, currency competition is universally good. Um, and no matter what kind of competition we have in the crypto space, you'll have to recognize there is always competition with Bitcoin from the outside. There are always alternatives to Bitcoin outside of crypto. So um, hating anything that's a copy of Bitcoin just because it's digital is, is almost as unreasonable as hating silver because it competes with Bitcoin, right? Um, but uh, I would say that the other thing is, uh, I think you're definitely right about friction um, with currencies. I think that the ultimate state of currencies appears to be that we'll probably have a long tail distribution of one currency, which is kind of, you know, rules them all. Um, and then others, which are either, you know, in various stages of trying to compete with that currency. Um, and most notably, I would add, there is one very useful effect of, of alternative currencies um, other than Bitcoin. And one reason they should stick around, including forks of Bitcoin, like BTC and BSV in this case. Um, they, uh, they serve um, in the same way that uh, when, when a big company puts up a server, 
um, and they're running a, 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 you know, one of their applications on that server in order to serve the public. Um, if that server goes down and the world ends because our money stops working, it's a big problem. Okay. So I think it's very, very unlikely that the entire world is going to be okay with, with us having one universal currency and no other alternatives waiting in the wings. Okay, so, so, so for that alone, I think that, that altcoins are useful. Okay, well, we're getting low on time, but I just want to hit uh, one other topic real quick. Um, Paul's favorite side chains, uh, maybe, right? So, uh, but, uh, so Paul, um, just tell us really quickly what a side chain is, and also tell us what, why should I use a side chain instead of an altcoin? Yeah, so, well, I mean, okay, so a side chain is basically an altcoin, but you use the BTC unit instead of having its own money, so it doesn't it doesn't create its own, uh, Litecoin creates its own Litecoin supply and then you pay Litecoin transaction fees and then you have to go to Shapeshift or Coinbase or whatever and buy them back and forth. But the way sidechains work is they start with no coins on them at all, zero, and then you, you deposit coins into them from the main chain. You start on Bitcoin Core and you click some buttons and your money disappears from over there and it reappears on the second piece of software, the sidechain. And then you can do... It's a, it's a different piece of software. So just like an altcoin, you can do whatever you want with it over there. You can have really bad design choices. You can invite all these crazy people to do this weird stuff. And then theoretically, you should be able to take the new owners who have the money on the side chain. They should be able to reassign it back. And it should show up back on Bitcoin Core where it's supposed to go. And why should you use one? I think really a lot of people... Um, Ask questions like that, or that are similar to that, or that question in particular. And I really think it's more like you inevitably would not have a choice because the smallest of the altcoins, you know, you'd you'd be copying all these altcoin features, and then there'd just be this crisis of confidence in each altcoin. One at a time, the smallest one would just kind of be eliminated, and there'd be a new smallest one, and people would think, "Why am I going along with this tiny altcoin when you could do the exact same thing, all the same exact features in Bitcoin Core?" So. It's just a very strong competitor. You have just easier to have one money instead of different monies. No exchange rate risk, uh, that type of thing. Okay. Um, what do we have, five minutes? Okay. All right, let's just take some questions because I'm sure people have questions, sir, in the front. So I, I, I know we talked a lot about the impact of uh, block size on um, the... Uh, as far as the ability to run a full node, and that seemed to be the major dip point of differentiation. But another, in my mind, another huge one is the structure of a fee market. Um, so I'd like uh, each of you to comment on what you think the, the future of a fee market looks like with a restricted or, or open block size, and, and d is it necessary to have an eternal blocks, blocks full fee market established before the reward subsidy, or you know, how is that going to work? Which one of you wants to take it? Yeah, so uh, definitely there needs to be a fee market for Bitcoin to succeed eventually, whether that's done through a block size limit or not. Um, I actually take a different position than a lot of uh, maximalists. If there needs to be a fee market for security, miners have the power to implement a block size limit to force a fee market. Um, so I've never, I've been less concerned about the fee market because the miners, that's, they can solve the problem themselves. By doing that, um, if they don't, for whatever reason, if the incentives for the miners don't, then yes, a user-defined uh, fee market would be needed, uh, and that could be done as well. So worst case scenario, uh, you do that. But again, the block size limit is a hard fork, and that's you know whether we want to say, change it or whether it's optimal or, 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 or not, uh, that's a different issue because you're basically forcing a split of the currency. So I, it's almost like a non-starter for, for most cases. And, um, I should. Uh, I don't have much to add to that specifically, um, and I also don't have uh, many original ideas on the subject. But if you're curious, you should watch uh, part four of Paul's video on side chains. When I talk about what he was saying, where the miners can, can paradoxically they can make more <laughs> money and have most can have the ability and the incentive to. But the, I, I have some recent thoughts about that, which are that the mere existence of altcoins probably makes it so that people are unwilling to pay. So even though miners can like fee maximize, they may literally not be able to get that maximized number uh, very high. And we see this in Bitcoin Core today where the fees are very low. Um, despite the currency kind of being more famous than ever, 
Uh, and I wonder what will happen the next hype cycle if uh, people will decide that they're willing to pay $50 fees or if that will only ever be like a kind of a temporary thing like during bubbles and then when the dust settles, people will figure out that they can batch the transactions or use altcoins or just use some kind of like Coinbase pay thing or something like that and then they will not want to be paying these fees on chain. And so as a result, I think the, there is a danger that the even though the fee market could be maximized, it would only be maximized at a, basically a, an amount of money that is not much higher than it is today, ever, and that would that would not be good as the block size, uh, the the subsidy, the 12.5 keeps getting halved, that, would, that wouldn't be great. Because but it would be great if we had side chains and they were merged mind, you could collect all the fees uh, from all the sides, so it's, so, so I have all the answers. Like fees. Agreed. You have one? Here we go. <laughs> I think I kind of got Paul's answer to this already, but I wonder about the other two. Like, yeah. do you think it would be okay if it was more expensive to open up a payment channel than it is to run a full node? Because I think that the way y'all are talking, that could be something that you would foresee happening. I love that as an example because it um, it is. There are a lot of economic questions that that uh, you can have kind of a kind of a funny opinion about it until you try to take it to its logical extreme, um, and that that does indicate to us that what we're talking about is a value judgment um, between two options. Um, and in my opinion, the, the, the you know, channels should be significantly cheaper to open than running a full node because um, there's always an incentive for people to verify that the chain is honest. Um, and because I want to know if I've been paid, it's either um, based for me personally, I can decide if I want to know definitively enough to run my own full node, or if I just want to, for example, pay someone else to run it for me, and you know, trust that the wallet that I use from uh, you know, Edge or BitPay or Copay or, or Coinbase or whatever, trust that that wallet is correct and is telling me honest things about BTC, the state, the current head, the state of the BTC or BSV or BCH chain. Um, so it's a, it becomes an it's simply a, a value judgment for the participants. Uh, the incentives don't actually, don't actually change here. We're just talking about a scale. When you have a payment channel as a one-time event, running a node is an ongoing cost, too. So it's, it's kind of like, should my rent be more than my food? Or, I guess, a dinner out. Um, you know, that's one-time expense versus ongoing. So it's hard to compare them. And, again, it's value judgment. The payment channel itself becomes not very valuable when you can never validate that it's actually valid. So if, if, if you've destroyed the whole incentive to use it, what good is it? So it may, may not be a choice we can make. Um, and it's not something that should be centrally planned um, or decided. It's, it's going to evolve organically. Question hey, block out. over here. Um, I wanted you to expand. Uh, in, you talked about censorship in Lightning. I want you to expand a little bit on that. Uh, I couldn't understand. How the network could be censored. You're saying about censorship Less. resistant and lightning? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you um, mentioned it during your talk. I, One of so, your. So, censorship resistance is a vague term for a lot of things. Um, but, uh, and so fundamentally, you have, to, you have to think about the thing, specifically the threat model you're considering. Um, and there are certain properties of, of lightning that are advantageous compared to on chain transactions. And there are certain other properties that are not. Um, so, uh, among them, um, at least in, uh, in the American system of government, um, lightning nodes are uh, perhaps slightly more targetable than end users are. And so even if, uh, if you like your politicians now, it's conceivable that in 10 or 15 years or whatever, um, there will be politicians you don't like and they will make it illegal to do whatever. Um, and uh, it might be completely arbitrary. Um, and there are certain properties about lightning that are, that are slightly different. Um, one thing that I really like about Bitcoin is um, the system is, is very, very fundamentally censorship resistant. Mining can be done um, practically anonymously. You can throw a block up from anywhere in the world one time from one connection, and then you can disappear. And the world doesn't care who you are or, or how you did that. All they care about is that the hash has enough zeros at the beginning, right? Um, and so uh, <laughs> you're in the knots, correct. Um, so uh, that is a very, very cool property. Um, and I, mind you, right now the mining ecosystem is, is very highly connected, but only because they're not threatened. Um, the current model for Bitcoin also works in a very threatened model, and it's one of the reasons that I think it actually prevents Bitcoin from being attacked in that way, because 
you know, that attack degrades to something where the, where the miners win anyways. Um, so, but the same is not true necessarily for something that are long ongoing connections where you need to maintain a stable identity and a stable network connection and there are capital requirements for what you keep in the channel. Um, so it, it has very different censorship resistant properties. There are some things that are nice about it and that you, know, you get some privacy in the end user. You, you know, there are some privacy things you can get out of it that are currently not very possible on chain. Um, you, know, you might actually be censored for, from certain Bitcoin services because uh, you try to use um, coin join transactions. Um, but uh, in Lightning, that, that's hidden from the network. However, there are other pro properties about it that are not so censorship resistance, and, um, and they are kind of existential threat problems that I would be worried about. Is this the, um, I thought that the, the argument against Lightning being a money transmitter legal FUD had been passed and we're moving on to, it's just not usable, but no, no, um, I, I, if it's, <laughs> if, if yeah. this is back up, we can, I, I don't know of any serious legal opinion that has thought that this is like something that's directly targetable more than Bitcoin is running a full note. So uh, it's, you know, it's nice seeing the, 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 the goalposts move like that, but um, I think that means we're, Lightning's winning. Um, we're, we're, but we're talking about threat models here. And the, wh what I'm discussing is, is actually a threat model thing. So I know that your current batch of politicians have said that what you're doing is okay. How, how but, is a politician gonna stop Lightning? Um, if you have to maintain a stable connection and a stable identity, it's significantly easier to target meat space, whoever's behind that identity. Yeah, you're talking like, like a sort of bandwidth type of yeah. thing that you're yes, interacting right. with exactly. some yeah. server or something. Right. It, so they it, could ban me from using a Bitcoin node too, because that's using no, a lot can, of bandwidth? No, they can come and they, they, if they can find who you are, then fundamentally the threat model there is a little bit different than, uh, it's, than it being possible for you to completely anonymously participate in the system at you know, basically one packet at a time. Uh, you, know, uh, you can mine a block, send a packet, and disappear. Um, it, the same is not true necessarily as a censorship resistant property of, of Lightning. So it, it, is, it is not something, I, it's not saying, I'm not saying lightning is a bad thing because there's some really cool things you can do with lightning. I'm very excited about it. Um, but I, I, would not, I would not throw out the rest of the system simply because I wouldn't want to see a future in which uh, we get a bad batch of politicians and they suddenly decide that maybe it, you know, their version of whatever money transmitting looks like does apply to our system. Um, and uh, the, the, the terms for it are actually imprisonable by 10 years or something. Like owning gold was in 1933. Yeah. It's not my biggest light, it's not my biggest lightning concern out of all that. I think they have this, we don't have time to talk about it, but there's this bank run thing that people rarely talk about, which I think is the big lightning problem and that someone will have to crack. <laughs> so, and uh, so, I think there's a lot, but there's it's a, generally more yeah. private. Lightning, I think. <laughs> uh -oh. Sorry. Yeah. Do you have an are we going to take one more question? Two Hi guys, thanks for the panel. Um, you guys kind of unanimously made a statement about Ethereum was a failure. And so kind of absolutes like that are always nice to challenge. And so if Ethereum is a failure because it costs so much to run a node, and I think it was quoted about five, let's just say even 10 grand a yeah, year. Yeah, I made that up. But I think that's basically what they, that company, in, I can't even pronounce their name, it says with an I, in Fura or something. Correct, so five, 10 grand a year to run your own full node. That's within the price point of easily thousands, if not 10,000 companies in the world. And you also made the statement that it's a great area of how many nodes is enough. And all of them are, are checking the exact same transactions on the blockchain. Now is literally five, 10,000 nodes distributed across the world in different geographic jurisdictions enough to feel comfortable about Again, I, I validation don't care of about network? The, the quantity of nodes I think is a big red herring and people get distracted by that. It's, I, it's for me, it's 100% the cost of the, the full node. So it doesn't matter, like someone could spin up a million nodes and then close 500,000 of them down. And so this quantity of full nodes thing, and it would look what like What does the, the cost change, have anything to do happened. with it? What does the yeah, cost have anything to do with it? If there's enough your people option, if you're that wondering whether they get paid. There's enough people that check each other. So it's a system yeah. of checks and balances, like any governance Perfectly protocol. Metallic. So if you have enough people that are running, or companies that are running the nodes, and they are incentivized not to cheat because there's thousands of other people that can call them out on it, then how many is enough? Well, I, I want to clarify also that I, didn't, I don't necessarily fall in the camp that thinks that Ethereum is a failure. Actually, it's, um, right, yeah, I, I, I didn't weigh I apologize. in on that one. But, yeah, I apologize yeah, for but, blanking uh, yeah, you so, that. I, and, and that's a great example of uh, a place where um, competition is valuable and the Ethereum ecosystem has clearly chosen a slightly different position on the scale of, of you know, on the value judgment scale of how, basically how big the block sizes should be. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but I, I wouldn't make any, I, I wouldn't personally make any strong judgment on it. I don't have a strong opinion on it. We have, you said $10,000 a year now. And what's actually being used on Ethereum? We have empty dApps that no one uses. We have a bunch of tokens that get passed around. 
that could be done in anything else. And when CryptoKitties gets popular, the whole thing comes to its knees. So let's 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 actually scale this to actually real volume. And that ten thousand becomes a hundred thousand or a million yeah, exactly. or ten million if there's anything significant going, going on it. And at that point, just put in AWS. I, I'm not we sure. Are, I mean, just have Vitalik sign some. Blocks. It's weird. It's weird to be arguing in favor of Ethereum, but I'm not sure if it's particularly fair to to talk about Ethereum coming to its knees when people were making hundred dollar Bitcoin transactions in November of 2017. Well, I would just December, say so also like, that I'm a Ethereum of never, that, never that bad. Ethereum was that. I mean. People were paying $100 of Bitcoin because Bitcoin was doing something valuable. Ethereum was doing CryptoKitties. Also which of yeah, but that's, system but you that's want. just subjective But I don't value. think it's a, if yeah, it's, crypto it's not a fair That goes back to the whole spam discussion about what transact. I mean, a dApp for CryptoKitties might not be cool to you, but it might be worth a million bucks to someone else. That's just right. totally subjective. Consumer sovereignty. Uh, but I would like to I have to say that I'm a proponent of letting people make this mistake completely on their own in <laughs> sidechains. They can, you know, I think it's fair. Actually, I gave a present at Scaling 3. I presented on actually, since if you had both options, they'd probably both be better because you could make one, the small block thing, be smaller, and then it would be just more objectively easier to run the node and more secure. And then you could have the large block be bigger, and then it would also be like, it would be kind of an interesting situation where. Because the way sidechains work, um, you, it's doing the accounting for you, so you know there's no inflation on the sidechain just by running the tinier main chain node. And there's also less of an incentive for someone, I think, to actually come in and just stomp and destroy the, uh, the sidechain node because it doesn't really do... Whereas it, it would be an existential threat to Bitcoin and just destroy Bitcoin if there was the one, all the nodes were destroyed. If all the sidechain nodes are destroyed, it's just kind of like being on pause. And the network's just on pause until they, someone starts them back up again. So I actually did present a little bit on how I think it's, okay. people should be allowed to do that. Okay, great. Thanks for everyone for coming. Um, what's the next uh, talk here? When's the lightning talk, guys? In here, I think. And you're talking somewhere. Go Alan's talking lightning. somewhere. Okay, okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Stay around. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>